On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with Dr. Bernardo Castrup, author of Dreamed Up Reality. You make some really interesting connections about the relationship, for example, between the fainting game you just mentioned, or erotic asphyxiation, and also some of this new research with psychedelic mushrooms that suggest that when we really look at what's going on in the brain, as opposed to what we would expect of an excitation of certain brain areas, we actually see a dampening down of brain areas. So what would be the implications of that in terms of this idea of filtering of consciousness? The current paradigm says that uh, conscious experience is a epiphenomenon or a byproduct generated by brain activity. So you should be able to always find a tight correlation between conscious states as reported by the subject and, and measurable brain states as measured, for instance, with an fMRI MRI scanner. Um, usually this correlation is there, but there are instances like this study that you alluded to in the UK where this correlation is not there in a very spectacular and repeatable way. Now, this breaks the correlation. The paradigm would require that an unfathomable experience, any experience whatsoever actually, should be correlated with brain, brain activity an excitation of the brain, not a dampening down. That, that is a fundamental break with the paradigm as I see it, and there is no way of escaping from this. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on this episode of Skeptica, we welcome Dr. Bernardo Kastrup. Now, there's a name you haven't heard before. You know, when I started Skeptica, one of the goals that I had in mind was that there are a lot of really, really brilliant people out there that we don't really hear enough about. One of the goals of Skeptica was to bring those people forward, and I'm really happy to say that I think Bernardo Kastrup is just one such person, and I'd have to put his imaginative ideas and his creative way of describing them right up there among the very best guests we've had here on Skeptico. But what I'd really like to do is see what you think. So let's get on to my interview with Dr. Bernardo Kastrup. Today's guest is an author, blogger, an entrepreneur with a PhD in computer engineering, and an all-around fascinating guy, Bernardo Kastrup. Welcome to Skeptico. Thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Bernardo, a, a lot of folks might have come across you in the Skeptico Forum. I read a terrific blog post of yours in your blog, Metaphysical Speculations. I thought it was really great. A lot of folks on the Skeptico Forum reacted very positively to it. We had a really interesting conversation going there. And then I, I delved in further, and I heard from your publicist, and I found out you have a brand new book, and it's your third in a series of what looks like just tremendous books. So we really have a lot to talk about today, and I'm looking forward to it. Sure, I've been looking forward to this for, for quite a while, Alex. So Bernardo, where I thought we might start, since there's probably a lot of folks who aren't familiar with your work, tell us a little bit about your background, your blog, and of course, your books. Well, I have a... Um quite a scientific background even, if you will, a very rationalistic background. I have a degree in, in computer engineering. I have worked as a scientist, as a scientist in different places, including CERN uh, in Switzerland. Uh, I have lived alongside uh, materialistic scientists. And, and, I, and I used to think like that. In a way, uh, that was not only who I am, but in a way who I feel I, I, I represent uh, today. Um, but over time, uh, working in, the, in that environment, um, one becomes slowly cognizant of, of, of the hidden assumptions of the scientific paradigm, the hidden subjective value system, uh, the hidden assumptions about the nature of reality that we all make without knowing we are making them. And once you become aware of that, uh, you can't avoid but start pursuing different avenues of thought, different avenues of investigation, either empirical and scientific when, when it's possible and when it's not possible, uh, a philosophical uh, approach uh, to understanding the nature of reality. And, and that, that's the path I have been pursuing over the last few years. Awesome. You know, and I think there's really, that might not sound like something that a lot of folks can wrap their arms around, but 
once they read some of your writing, I think they'll appreciate more of what you're saying because I get that from reading your work is that there is this philosophical bent, but it's not a purely philosophical approach. It seems to be very grounded in not only uh, science, but kind of reason and logic. And with that in mind, I guess I'd like to kind of direct us into one of these blog posts that relates back to to your books, and I hope you'll tell us how it does tie into your books. But the blog post was on consciousness and memory. And let me tee you up with just a little quote here, and then we can bounce off of that and see where we go. But consciousness may never be absent, you say. What we refer to as periods of unconsciousness, be they sleep, anesthesia, or feigning, may be reinterpreted as periods in which memory formation is impaired. There there isn't anything super controversial there, but it's really deep in terms of its implications. Can you expound on that a little bit and and maybe tell us some examples of of how that comes into play? Sure. Well... I've been thinking about consciousness for for quite a while now because it it is the sore spot in the materialistic paradigm, in the current scientific paradigm. The the one thing we cannot explain even in principle, we cannot deduce from anything that we know empirically in science today. Um, The assumption we make usually is that consciousness somehow is generated by the brain. Nobody nobody knows how, uh, but that's the assumption we make. Therefore, if the brain is impaired because you, you are asleep and you're not in a dream state or because you fainted or you are under uh, anesthesia, that consciousness then disappears. But one cannot tell the difference, of course, between the absence of an experience or the absence of a memory of an experience. It is impossible for us empirically from a first person person perspective to tell that difference. So the, the absence of consciousness or the assumption that consciousness may be absent when we interfere with the brain in certain ways, natural, natural or unnatural, uh, is considered an empirical reason to believe that consciousness is generated by the brain. Um, but it may be different. It may be that uh, interference with the brain uh, interferes with memory formation that consciousness perhaps was there all along. Maybe you were in amazing dream worlds while you were undergoing surgery under anesthesia. Um, It it is known worldwide that, for instance, teenagers play a very dangerous game called the the fainting game, in which they on purpose uh, choke themselves to to have a mystical experience and and hopefully return, which is something that is not recommended for anyone to do. Uh, But all these things are suggestive that consciousness... uh, goes on during periods in which we are assumed to be unconsciousness, unconscious. And the only thing that gets impaired is the formation of a memory that gives you later access to that experience. Yeah, again, if we just compare that to what we do know scientifically, it really becomes rather obvious, right? So you, what you're saying is we can hook you up and monitor your brain activity while you're sleeping and moreover monitor your eyes and we say, ah, you're in REM state, you're having a dream, and we can compare that pattern to other people that remember having a dream. And then you might wake up and say, I, I didn't have any dream. I didn't have anything. And then from that first person account and for everything that you can say about it, you have not had that experience. And yet we have this other empirical evidence that suggests you did have a conscious experience. Yeah, that, that's, you pointed out one asymmetry, which is uh, you have no memory of a conscious experience while through, say, fMRI, people can make a measurement uh, of your brain states and, and empirically derive that so probably you had an experience, but you just don't remember it. That's one asymmetry. The other asymmetry, which I find much more interesting, is when you do have a memory of a conscious experience, but there is no measurable brain activity. And there are many examples of that, some of them repeatable now through the use of psychoactive substances, as has been done in the UK recently. Fascinating. And let's talk about filtering of consciousness, because you make some really interesting connections in this blog post, and I assume in your books as well, about the relationship, for example, between the fainting game you just mentioned, or erotic asphyxiation, and also some of this new research with psychedelic mushrooms that suggest that when we really look at what's going on in the brain, as opposed to what we would expect of an excitation of certain brain areas, we actually see a dampening down 
of brain areas. So what would be the implications of that the way you see it in terms of this idea of filtering of consciousness? Well, the, the paradigm, the current paradigm says that uh, conscious experience is a epiphenomenon or a byproduct uh, or, or in, any way, in any case generated by brain activity. So you should be able to always find a tight correlation between conscious states as reported by the subject and, and measurable brain states as measured, for instance, with an fMRI MRI scanner. Um, usually this correlation is there, which, which indicates that there is a tight relationship between the brain and consciousness. And, and that's something we have to grapple with. We cannot ignore that. That's empirical evidence. But there are instances, like this study that you alluded to in the UK, where this correlation is not there in a very spectacular and repeatable way. Uh, in, in this study in the UK, uh, subjects were given psilocybin, and they had unfathomable conscious experiences beyond anything they have ever, ever experienced before in their lives. And the only thing they could measure in the fMRI was a dampening down of brain activity in certain key areas. No excitation anywhere. Now, this breaks the correlation. The paradigm would require that an unfathomable experience, any experience whatsoever actually, should be correlated with brain, brain activity an excitation of the brain, not a dampening down. That, that is a fundamental break with the paradigm as I see it, and there is no way of escaping from this uh, today. Um, what it suggests, in my view, you, you alluded to the brain as a filter, that idea, what it suggests is that um, we have to find a, another, another model of reality, if you will, to accommodate this, a model that accommodates both the fact that normally, ordinarily, conscious experience is modulated by brain states. Uh, you experience this every time you get drunk, for instance. There is a correlation there. We cannot escape from this. But also sometimes there is a lack of correlation in a spectacular way. And the brain filter model accommodates for both. Uh, it suggests that in ordinary states, when our brain is functioning normally as evolution had it work, uh, you, you have this correlation because the brain filters uh, conscious experience in such a way that it modulates conscious experience. So if you interfere with the mechanism of this filtration process, the material brain, through, for instance, getting drunk or whatever, uh, you will observe a change in conscious experience since it's modulated by the filter. But if you take the filter down in certain ways, then your consciousness should expand to the extent that it's no longer filtered. And there, there is plenty of recent empirical evidence about this. Not only this study in the UK, but uh, studies done with patients that suffered brain damage as a result of surgery. Uh, there's a study published in, in Neuron, uh, uh, Neuroscience uh, uh, Journal in 2010 that elaborates on this extensively. Um, reports from people who have suffered uh, um, uh, strokes. Uh, there's a famous one, uh, Dr. Jill Bautit Taylor, a neuroanatomist that reported on her experiences on this, uh, and many other instances. And I think the brain filter theory is much more uh, amenable uh, to, to, to the empirical evidence than the current paradigm as it is stated. And why don't you refine for us a little bit, Bernardo, the concept of the filter? Because I think you make a great point in the most recent post that I read where you point out how if we take it too literally, that metaphor, it can appear like a contradiction, but it, it doesn't have to be. And, and that we're in this kind of difficult space when we talk about these things because, well, just the nature of it, of analyzing our, 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 our brain and the kind of recursive nature of it, but also just that we're kind of struggling for metaphors that don't always fit. Talk a little bit about that. The brain filter theory is not recent. It comes, well, it's at least... 100 years old. It started even before Henry Bergson, which was the first person to really elaborate on this in, in the late 1800s. Uh, but the idea there is that consciousness is a fundamental property of nature, maybe the one property of nature, irreducible, unbound, not subject to space-time limitations. In other words, your true subject, your true I, would in principle be able to be aware of everything that has ever happened, is happening, or will ever happen anywhere in the known and unknown universe. And the role of the brain and the, way, the reason why it has evolved was to localize consciousness in the space-time locus of the body, because that would obviously give a survival advantage. It would make you care about your physical body through identifying with it. 
Uh, and it would be less confusing also to survive as an organism if your consciousness is localized on your immediate surroundings in space-time. Um, but what this seems to imply, and that's what you allude to, is it seems to imply dualism. It seems to imply that there is such a thing as mind stuff, which is unlimited and unbound, and there is matter, a completely different kind of stuff, uh, which filters down mind stuff. Uh, that's dualism. Um, I am not necessarily completely opposed to dualism, although I do find it uh, inflationary. It makes two fundamental assumptions as opposed to one, as materialism would have it or idealism would have it. Idealism is the philosophy that everything is only mind stuff. Um, so personally, I subscribe more to the philosophy of, of idealism, which is that nature is exactly what it seems to be. It's only what is in the mind. Uh, in, in materialism, we project this abstraction that there is something out there that we do not have direct access to, which stimulates our sense organs and creates our mind picture of the world. But that thing out there in itself is independent of mind. Uh, I think that is also a, a, a leap of faith, uh, not skeptical enough leap of faith. Uh, but then you are, if you, if you believe in what I just said, then you have to explain how the brain as a consciousness filter being part of reality and therefore being consciousness itself, how can it filter consciousness? In other words, how can consciousness filter itself? That seems to be a self-referential contradiction. Right, and I like in your post when you break it down to a very concrete example, we can't have a coffee filter made out of coffee. So it would, yeah. it would appear to be a contradiction when we say we have a consciousness filter made out of consciousness. But I'm sorry, go ahead, finish and tell us why that isn't necessarily a contradiction. In, in, the, in the blog post you refer to, I, 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 I try to come up with a couple of metaphors. One of them is the metaphor of a, a whirlpool in, in, in a stream, in a water stream. Um, if you go to a stream and you see a whirlpool, you can localize it, you can delineate its boundaries, you can point at it and say, oh, there, there is a whirlpool, it's very concrete, it's very defined, there is no question about how palpable and material it is. Um, at the same time, there is nothing to the whirlpool but water. It's just made of water, and yet it localizes water in a sort of a, a loopy trajectory that sort of uh, um, limits and filters down, if you will, limits the water molecules to a, to a specific tra circular trajectory and, and doesn't allow them, those molecules to traverse the entire stream. That's a kind of localization mechanism, a kind of filtering down mechanism in which water localizes itself in a whirlpool. So the hypothesis is, could the brain be exactly such a thing? Could the brain be as anything else, according to idealism, just a figment in consciousness, just an image in consciousness, and yet as an image represent a process through which consciousness localizes itself, just like water localizes itself in a whirlpool? Uh, that's the hypothesis that I bring up. We need, more, we need a new language to talk about these things. Uh, materialism has evolved a very sophisticated, very precise language. Uh, we need something of that nature for, for idealism. Uh, we need time to develop that, I think. Right. By the same token, we don't need a, a new language or additional time in order to point out the problems with materialism, the problems with reductionism, which I think you do a great job of doing. So these anomalies that you're talking about, for example, with the psilocybin, with um, the reduced brain function, brain injuries that lead to increased consciousness, all those things have to be explained because as we know in the way that paradigms evolve and change, it's always these little problems on the border that turn out to be the, the big problems that overturn a paradigm. So I really like uh, the way that, that, that you push it, right? I mean, we, we do have to be concerned about these anomalies. We can't just sweep them off the table and say, well, you know, materialism seems to work pretty good in, in, in the general sense, right? Yeah, uh, this has happened again and again throughout history, right? As Thomas Kuhn has pointed out already in the 60s. And every time 
that a generation adopts a certain paradigm, it thinks that it has, it has figured it out, that it's a, just a matter of fine-tuning, even though it knows that for hundreds of years before, every previous generation has been wrong. But we think finally now we got it right uh, until the paradigm will, will change again. I think these anomalies, uh, they are major anomalies. They are gigantic anomalies. Right. Uh, the, the, the only way we can get away with them and still honestly believe in the materialistic paradigm, as many of us do, and I think it's an honest belief, it's not a conspiracy of any kind, uh, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, the way we can do that is because that paradigm embodies an approach of looking upon the world that is a third-person perspective. In other words, um, it's not through personal experience, but through reports and measurements. And um, and the anomalies, the nature of the anomalies uh, that we are talking about uh, is very personal. These are first-person experiences. Uh, it's very easy for someone who has not had the experience and is just listening to a report or, or to a metaphor to come and say, oh, you know what, it's just you know, oxygen starvation or it's just blood flow to the retina being, being reduced from the outer edges uh, inwards to the center. It's very easy to say that in a very reasonable way if you have not had the experience to the extent and to the strength, to the magnitude that other people have. But as a person who has had the experience, if, if I had been one of those people, I would be able to judge those explanations and very easily discard them as inappropriate uh, uh, from a first-person perspective. And people do that, but our culture, our paradigm does not consider that a, a, a valid point because we are too addicted to measurement and a third-person perspective while the nature of the anomaly is personal. And I think that is where we are, we are hitting a roadblock. Right. And the other point that you make that I think is, is really right on on this is that there's a certain uncomfortableness that we experience when we go to this border between this otherworldly experience, this greater consciousness and coming back. And that there's a certain built-in mechanism that we have in this brain-body thing that we have that makes it very uncomfortable for us to switch back and forth. And I think maybe you want to speak to that a little bit, but I think that's a great point, is that there is this balance, this very delicate balancing on a razor's edge that we must walk to even experience or talk about this stuff. The reality we ordinarily live in is as much perceived as it is constructed through language. Uh, th this is a fact of neuroscience. This is a fact of the current paradigm. It, it, it's not polemic, right? We, we know this, that much of what we believe, we experience, we actually infer. We don't perceive, we infer, and we infer that largely through constructs of language. Our thoughts are coextensive with the way we speak. Um, so, we live in this ordinary reality that is largely generated by language, and if we drift to a less filtered, a less localized state of consciousness, what you may experience could quite easily transcend uh, the constructs of language, because language has not evolved to represent that. We do not have a shared dictionary, if you will, to talk about those kinds of experiences. Language evolved for practical reasons, to coordinate our activities in the ordinary empirical world, uh, not to describe those things. So language breaks down. So when you go there and you come back and you try to articulate that in language, uh, it, it can be a disaster. It can be a circus of contradictory metaphors. I think I think that's one aspect that makes it uncomfortable. Right, but let me just interject, because another aspect of it, beyond the language and beyond all that, is, hey, i got to get out and pick up the pizza and bring it home in time that I can help the kids with the homework, get them down to sleep with a good story that's going to make them feel good, and then get me down to sleep with a good story that makes me feel good, so I can get up and somewhat have a reasonable life and do all this tomorrow. And I feel comfortable with that because I know how uncomfortable it is when I stray too far from that. And I somehow have to integrate that in as well. So, you know, on a really practical level, and, and we've spoken on this show to folks who do seem to be challenged with this broader conscious experience that doesn't integrate well with the day-to-day -day life that we all like to live. Yeah, Carl Jung used to say that uh, 
uh, the human being needs a myth in order to live. And, and a myth didn't mean, right. he didn't mean that it's a lie, that it's untrue. All he meant was that we need an image of the world through which we can explain the world to ourselves, right? And we settle into that image once we have it and we become, we become comfortable with it. It gives us reassurance. It gives us some foundation uh, for thinking, deciding on you know, the key questions of our lives and, and, and living. Um, and once you have a, an experience like that, that transcends the models you previously had or the models that you heard from anyone and even the structures of language that you can use to explain to yourself what's going on, I, it can be very, very uncomfortable, very hard to integrate. And I can easily believe that uh, the way some people react to this at an unconscious level even is to forget it, is to not hold to the right. memory, is to right. completely ignore and say, nothing happened. I, I, I don't remember anything. Right. This is all nonsense. <laughs> Right. And, and, you know, and then if we broaden that from an individual level to a group level, we can talk about, as you do, how our culture then starts building in more and more uh, systems that prevent us from having those larger experiences because they don't integrate well with the broader social, cultural uh, not only norms, but uh, goals and directions that we have. So do you want to maybe speak in, speak to that a little bit? You mentioned how our, our, we're less connected to nature, we're, we're less connected to uh, hard work, we're less connected to maybe some advanced breathing or meditation techniques, all those things that could connect us to that broader consciousness we are systematically removed from by our culture. Yeah, I think if you look at primitive societies, uh, pre-literary societies, aboriginals, uh, however you want to call them, um, these were societies that didn't have the level of comfort we have today. Today we eat regularly, uh, we, we treat chronic disease, uh, we work eight hours, maybe 10 hours, 12 hours a day, maybe I and you worked a little bit more in our past. Um, but in general, we have a very grounded, comfortable uh, life, which allows our brain, our, the future of consciousness, if the hypothesis holds, uh, to operate uh, very well, consistently, day after day. Uh, and that's good in a way, but that takes away our access to what you could call, I, I, I don't like this word very much, but I will use it because it communicates the idea well, it, it cuts our access to the other world, if you will. And primitive cultures, uh, those guys were exposed to uh, strenuous effort, to malnutrition, chronic disease, exposure to the elements. Uh, uh, their bodies were subject to constant stress that could impair uh, the functioning of the filter and would give them regular access to the other world, to this other world, if you will, between quotes, to the point that they would even um, induce that themselves through ordeals, exactly. through uh, breathing techniques, through initiation rituals, through all kinds of things that today we discard as, as uh, um, nonsense, if you will, as, as supersti superstition. Um, and they evolved the language over time that we consider mythical and, and metaphorical. They evolved the language to articulate and hold to the memories of those experiences and talk about it. When you can talk about something, uh, the memory uh, takes hold. It becomes part of your culture, becomes part of your reality. When your access to that world as a civilization is so restricted because we are so grounded on this side of the divide, we are so grounded on the filtered consciousness as opposed to the unfiltered one, if the hypothesis holds again, uh, we lost that language. We completely lost it. And if we don't have a language to talk about it, we can't hold to the experience. Um, psychotherapists, psychologists, uh, analysts, what they would tell you is to, to try to hold to those memories by giving them expression as soon as possible after an experience, like through drawing, through writing, through poetry, whatever way you can find to give it form so you can hold the, to those memories, create a language and talk about them. And I think that that's what we miss. Yeah, that's a great point. It makes you wonder which came first, the three-day sweat lodge followed by the three-day no food hike to the top of the mountain or the accidental experience of <laughs> expanded consciousness and then how do we recreate that kind of thing, right? I mean, that's what you're, you're kind of talking about. I think through being so good at improving our lives, we've shrunk uh, 
uh, our reality tunnel to an unprecedentedly uh, uh, narrow point. And to the point that we've lost the language to talk about anything more beyond this very narrow band where we live today. And it, 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 it's, it's a cruel thing, isn't it? I mean, we improved our lives in one sense and we've lost access in another sense. <laughs> yeah. L- let's talk about, uh, speaking of language, let's talk about a couple of words that you used before and try and nail those down. That is realism versus idealism. And maybe you can tell us why you're an idealist. Yeah. Um, I declare myself an idealist to make a point, although uh, my position is a little more subtle than that. I would be comfortable talking about this with you. Um, j- just for if, as an intro, realism is the philosophy or the worldview that says that uh, there is an objective world out there independent of mind, matter, space-time, energy. They exist independent of mind, of consciousness, and they stimulate our sense organs, thereby creating our conscious experiences inside our brains. That's the philosophy of realism. The world is objective, uh, and that objective world stimulates our, our sense perceptions. Let's talk about the implications for realism and what it means practically. The term I like to use, I, I borrowed from um, our good friend Richard Dawkins, you are a biological robot. That is the natural conclusion of realism, right? You're a biological robot. Everything reduces to matter, even though we don't really know what matter is. And we have these problems and we look at matter, is it is light a wave or a particle? What about the observer effect? All that is just kind of brushed aside. And the idea is everything is reducible. Well, what are some of the other, before we jump on to talking about idealism, what are some of the other problems that we run into when we try to hold on to this notion of realism? Well, if you look at physics, I mean, every branch of science has a tendency to self-negate at some point. It happened with mathematics, for instance, the project of Hilbert with Principia Mathematica to, 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 to ground all mathematics in very, very strict and clear axioms that failed. Godel has showed that logic is in, in inherently limited or contradictory. So if you pursue any branch of investigation to its ultimate conclusions, to its ultimate implications, it, it backfires on you. And the same happened with realism and physics in a way. Through the assumption of realism, we started looking at certain phenomena in physics, uh, namely quantum entanglement. And through a series of experiments, for instance, from 1981 culminating 2007, 2008, uh, we've, we've shown that uh, it is untenable to claim that um, the states of the physical world are independent of mind. Um, that has been published actually in Nature, I think Nature Volume 446, uh, spring of 2007. It's a very cryptic technical paper, but the conclusion is realism is either false or has to be redefined in a very counterintuitive way, in which, in which case you might ask yourself why to c- continue calling it realism anyway. So in a way, realism self-contradicts if you pursue it to its ultimate implications. And this is happening already, although the repercussions are extremely limited to a narrow field, to a narrow group of scientists that, 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 that understand the esoteric mathematics and the esoteric physics behind it, which is a pity. So it's a problem. There, there is a huge problem with realism today. It, it's not considered yet defeated, uh, but it's quite precarious for it. Okay, I'm sorry. Now go on and tell us about idealism. So idealism is it's a more skeptical philosophy. I think the problem with skeptics today is that they are not skeptic enough about their own paradigm of thought, their, their own hidden assumptions. Uh, the assumption behind realism is that, okay, you, you create a model of the world, namely matter, energy, and space-time. You project the independent reality of that model, and then you try to reconstruct your own primary experience back from that projected model. So there is a forward and a backward movement. It's quite, it, it's not parsimonious at all. There, there are lots of assumptions being made in that. Idealism is much simpler. Idealism, in a way, is the philosophy of a five-year-old kid. Uh, a five-year-old kid looks around, and what, what does he or she sees? He sees images. Images in consciousness. That's the primary date of experience. Of experience. That's, the, that's the carrier of reality as far as anyone can ever know 
images in consciousness. So the idealist starts from that. That is irreducible. I don't need to explain that. This is what exists images in consciousness. Everything else is an abstraction. And then I work with abstractions to try to make sense of my empirical experiences, be it scientific measurements, scientific experiments, or personal experiences. So for idealism, nature itself are images in consciousness. Everything else is an abstraction that we try to make, to use and to make sense of what we experience. Right. But as you point out, the problem with idealism is that we keep getting pulled back into this model of the world that seems to work pretty darn well. We drop the pencil off the desk and it falls down every time. We wake up and oh, without being conscious and everything is still the way that it was. So what are some of the problems with idealism? You allude, you allude to them. Uh, these are the problem the problems with idealism. One is the continuity of the world. We wake up to where the world has gone, apparently without us being consciousness, since we last went to sleep. That's a problem for idealism. The other one is the consistency of, of experience. If you have 10 people look at waves on a shore, they will all report the same thing, but well, save minor differences. Um, so there is a consistency in our experience of ordinary reality, which is a problem for idealism, because if it's all in the mind, how come we are all experiencing the same thing? Um, the way to get, get out of this apparent contradiction is to really get away from the hidden assumptions of realism. We are so contaminated by realism that we assume that minds are inside brains. And since brains are separate, how come we are all experiencing the same thing? These brains are not communicating, right? So that's where the, the, the problem comes from. It's this hidden assumption of realism. In idealism, if you're really consistent with it, the brain is in the mind, not the mind in the brain. The brain is an object of experience. I can hold a brain in my hands, and it's an image. It's part of the images of consciousness. That is in the mind, not the other way around. Maybe the other way around to some extent, but the starting assumption is that the brain is an object, an image in consciousness. Um, but nonetheless, the idealist still has to explain the continuity and the consistency of the world across subjects. There are many ways, I think, to model and to tentatively explain that. Many hypotheses that could make sense of that. One is that reality and even physics could be an emergent property of the interactions between localized minds. Uh, and I, I, I speak emergency, emergence in the technical sense, uh, in systems theory, an emergent property of, of the interaction between minds. Just like sand ripples are an emergent property of the interaction between individual grains of sand on a dune. Right. Um, another hypothesis is that um, the mind we ordinarily experience is restricted to the ego, but our true minds are much broader as depth psychology has empirically already inferred. And maybe these other segments of our mind that we are not n normally, ordinarily cognizant of, they have creative power as well as far as projecting reality. And uh, Jungians uh, uh, consider that there is a part of the mind that is collective, the collective unconscious. And that collective part could explain the consistency of experience if you go that far. That's something I talk about in my, my, in my third book. Now, the realist in my view, has a much more serious problem to deal with. The idealist has to explain uh, the continuity and the consistency of experience. There are many models to do that. The realist has to explain how conscious experience can emerge from unconscious matter. That's a much more fundamental jump. It's called the explanatory gap or, or the hard problem of consciousness. It's much more difficult much more fundamental. So whichever philosophy you pick, you have a hard problem to solve. I rather solve the problems of idealism. I think they're much more amenable to, to rational thought. Yeah, I'd agree. And I think it's interesting to bounce back and forth between the theory and then the practical applications on a bunch of different levels, the practical applications in science and some of the scientific problems that it might solve, but also the practical applications in culture and, and how we form things, because I can already hear the voices of the other side you know, immediately attacking the theory and, well, that theory, and it's like, well, wait a minute, I love the way you... you position it and say, yes, you know, these theories 
make us uncomfortable and, and seem counterintuitive, but we have to realize just how absurd the theory is that we are living under and the paradigm is that we're living under. So I thought I, I, I want to read uh, another quote from your writing because this, I think, this point about the absurdity just cannot be stressed enough because we really have to pound that home because we get exactly the opposite message. Here's the quote. The fact that our culture as a whole has adopted the assumption that reality is separate from our brains makes it easy for anyone to adopt the same assumption without looking like a fool. We find ourselves in a cultural context wherein an extraordinary form of self-deception has gained legitimacy. But then again, that we are collectively mad does not make it any less concerning that we are mad. So <laughs> talk a little bit about that, Bernardo. Well, it's part of human nature, right? Um, it's very easy for us to adopt um, very counterintuitive beliefs, um, beliefs that are not grounded on empirical evidence if they are shared by our peer group. Um, you just need to look at cultures around the world and see the different things they believe in. And from our point of view, they all seem crazy. But we, every one of us has a huge blind spot, which is the craziness of our own worldview. Uh, because we cannot look at it from the outside. We are immersed in it. It's like asking the fish to explain what water is. Uh, we can't. We are immersed in it. It's very difficult, and I don't blame anyone if they, they, they can't do that. It's very difficult to abstract from your own paradigm of thought and, and realize how mad your views about the world may be. Um, I personally have arrived at this conclusion that um, to believe that reality is out there even if nobody's looking is 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 extreme madness uh, it, it's an enormous leap of faith anyone with a pinch of skepticism should look very critically at that uh, and yet uh, that's the paradigm we live in and um, i don't think anybody is to blame it's uh, it has emerged to become like this as a reaction to what was seen during the Enlightenment as a culture of uh, superstition. Um, but the pendulum, pendulum oscillated very, very far to the other side, and today we are living the consequence of that. You know, you, you were talking about practical applications. If I can talk a little bit about that for, for a minute. Ultimately, idealism does not depart on, on a practical operational level, does not depart very much at all from realism. The predictions could be the same. Physics would still hold. It's just that matter is something in the mind. It doesn't exist objectively. So operationally and in terms of the development of technology, not much would change, at least not in the short term. The, the, the consistency would be very large. But there is one point of departure that is massive and has huge philosophical implications and huge implications for the way we live our lives which is, according to realism, if mind is generated by the brain, then it's over when the brain decomposes, when you die. And according to idealism, even though the operational consequences are pretty much the same, uh, when the brain decomposes, mind is free. It doesn't end. It's the opposite. And that, that's, that has enormous implications for, for how we live every day of our lives. And it, it is a pity that our madness is has brought us to, to this very cynical, negative, almost desperate uh, way of living our lives. In the time that we have left, why don't you take us through um, briefly your, your three books? I have not had a chance to read them, but they look absolutely amazing. Take us through the books and what we might find in them. Well, the first book is called uh, Rationalist Spirituality. Um, that was the first book I wrote. Um, and the attempt in that book is to to look at what we know in science today, to look at what we know in philosophy today, and try to derive what might, what could be a hypothesis for the meaning of existence. Why is this all going on? Is there one? And if there is, what could it be uh, based on science, based on logic, uh, rationality, and so on? Um, the second book is, is more empirical. Um, it, it's called Dreamed Up Reality, and it explores the idea of what one might perceive if one can tune down, can dumpen down the filters of consciousness operating inside the brain. What could be that broader reality and how could one try to perhaps model that in a way, develop a language 
um, and, and talk about it. And that's the attempt I have made. I even used some computer simulations to try to to articulate a model and articulate the implications of that model in a way that one could talk about it. And and I, and I don't mean that it that that model is correct. I don't even call it a theory. I call it a hypothesis. I, I just try to start a a a, a conversation. Uh, and the third book, it's out now this month, uh, or last month in December last year, um, it's called Meaning in Absurdity. And uh, the hypothesis there is, uh, could logic itself be an artifact of this narrow tunnel of reality that we've come to live in? Could the inherent degrees of freedom of nature be much broader than what is considered acceptable uh, by classical logic, by bivalent logic? And if that is the case... To what extent could that explain what we call absurd phenomena, what people throughout ages uh, have reported as things that are impossible on the face of it because they violate logic, not only physics? Uh, could there be some grounding for that? So that's what I try to explore in, in the third book. Fascinating. And people can also find you on your blog. And uh, you, you reference a lot of the, the work of your writing in your blog as well. Is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about the blog and what else you're doing these days? Um, well, my, my, my writing is actually a parallel life. It's, it's largely my, my, my hobby. I still work in, in high technology marketing. Um, the blog is uh, www.bernardocastrop.com, Castrop with a K, like Skeptico. Um, and I, I, I basically write down there um, my most recent thoughts and my most recent ideas. Participating in the forum of Skeptico has been very interesting for me because it has forced me to articulate some of those ideas you know, in a better way than I ever had done before because of the smart people there in the forum. I'm having a lot of fun there too. Um, and there are links to the books, uh, links to articles, links to videos. Uh, it's all in there, bernardocastrop.com. Great. Well, Bernardo, it's been just delightful having you on. You have so many stimulating ideas. I, I think since you like the forum, you're going to get quite a response in our forum from this interview. And I look forward <laughs> to seeing what you have to say. I'm looking forward to that, too. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us. Thanks a lot, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again to Bernardo for joining me today on Skeptico. If you enjoyed this interview, you're going to be happy to hear that we're going to be hearing more from Bernardo in the future. He's helping me on a couple of upcoming interviews and may even join me as a guest host on a couple of them. So we'll see how all that plays out. In the meantime, if you'd like to join me in a discussion about this interview, or for that matter, any of our previous interviews, please visit the Skeptico website. It's at skeptico.com. You'll also find a link to our forum, Facebook, email link to me, and a link to all our previous shows. Well, that's going to do it for today. I have several very interesting interviews coming up, and the schedule of interviews is getting kind of busy, so I might be cramming some extra shows in here as it goes. There's so many more interesting people to talk to, and my only limitation is I wish I had more time to talk to all of them. In the meantime, keep thinking about us. Tell other people about Skeptico. It's fun to see new and interesting people discover the show, go back through the episodes, and contribute to the ongoing dialogue we're having. So anything you can do to help that happen would be terrific. That's it for now. Until next time, take care and bye for now. I don't know, because it, it is the sore spot in the materialistic paradigm, in the current scientific paradigm. The, the one thing we cannot explain, even in principle, we cannot deduce from anything that we know empirically in science today. Um, the assumption we make usually is that consciousness somehow is generated by the brain. Nobody, nobody knows how, uh, but that's the assumption we make. Therefore, if the brain is impaired because you, you are asleep and you're not in a dream state or because you fainted or you are under uh, anesthesia, that consciousness then disappears. But one cannot tell the difference, of course, between the absence of an experience or the absence of a memory of an experience. It is impossible for us empirically from a first-person per 
person perspective to tell that difference. So the, the absence of consciousness or the assumption that consciousness may be absent when we interfere with the brain in certain ways, natural, natural or unnatural, uh, is considered an empirical reason to believe that consciousness is generated by the brain. Um, but it may be different. It may be that uh, interference with the brain uh, interferes with memory formation. That consciousness perhaps was there all along. Maybe you were in amazing dream worlds while you were undergoing surgery under anesthesia. Um, it, it is known worldwide that, for instance, teenagers play a very dangerous game called the, the fainting game, in which they, on purpose... Uh, cool speculations. I thought it was really great. A lot of folks on the Skeptico Forum reacted very positively to it. We had a really interesting conversation going there. And then I, I delved in further and I heard from your publicist and I found out you have a brand new book and it's your third in a series of what looks like just tremendous books. So we really have a lot to talk about today and I'm looking forward to it. Sure, I've been looking forward to this for, for quite a while, Alex. So Bernardo, where I thought we might start since there's probably a lot of folks who aren't familiar with your work, tell us a little bit about your background, your blog, and of course your books. Well, I have a... Um quite a scientific background even, if you will, a very rationalistic background. I have a degree in, in computer engineering. I have worked as a scientist, as a scientist in different places, including CERN uh, in Switzerland. Uh, I have lived alongside uh, materialistic scientists. And, and, I, and I used to think like that. In a way, uh, that was not only who I am, but in a way who I feel I, I, I represent uh, today. Um, but over time, uh, working in, the, in that environment, um, one becomes slowly cognizant of, of, of the hidden assumptions of the scientific paradigm, the hidden subjective value system, uh, the hidden assumptions about the nature of reality that we all make without knowing we are making them. And once you become aware of that, uh, you can't avoid but start pursuing different avenues of thought, different avenues of investigation, either in On this episode of Skeptico... Alex talks with Dr. Bernardo Castrup, author of Dreamed Up Reality. You make some really interesting connections about the relationship, for example, between the fainting game you just mentioned, or erotic asphyxiation, and also some of this new research with psychedelic mushrooms that suggests that when we really look at what's going on in the brain, as opposed to what we would expect of an excitation of certain brain areas, we actually see a dampening down of brain areas. So what would be the implications of that in terms of this idea of filtering of consciousness? The current paradigm says that a conscious experience is a epiphenomenon or a byproduct generated by brain activity. So you should be able to always find a tight correlation between conscious states as reported by the subject and, and measurable brain states as measured, for instance, with an fMRI MRI scanner. Um, usually this correlation is there, but there are instances like this study that you alluded to in the UK where this correlation is not there in a very spectacular and repeatable way. Now, this breaks the correlation. The paradigm would require that an unfathomable experience, any experience whatsoever actually, should be correlated with brain, brain activity an excitation of the brain, not a dampening down. That, that is a fundamental break with the paradigm as I see it. And there is no way of scapericle and scientific when, when it's possible and when it's not possible, uh, a philosophical uh, approach uh, to understanding the nature of reality. And, and that, that's the path I have been pursuing over the last few years. Awesome. You know, and I think there's really, that might not sound like something that a lot of folks can wrap their arms around, but once they read some of your writing, I think they'll appreciate more of what you're saying, because I get that from reading your work, is that there is this philosophical bent, but it's not a purely philosophical approach. It seems to be very grounded in not only uh, science, but kind of reason and logic. And with that in mind, I guess I'd like to kind of direct us into one of these blog posts that relates back to to your books, and I hope you'll tell us how it does tie into your books. But the blog post was on consciousness and memory. And let me tee you up with just a little quote here, and then we can bounce off of that and see where we go. But consciousness may never be absent, you say. What we refer to as periods of unconsciousness 
be they sleep, anesthesia, or feigning, may be reinterpreted as periods in which memory formation is impaired. There, there isn't anything super controversial there, but it's really deep in terms of its implications. Can you expound on that a little bit and, and maybe tell us some examples of, of how that comes into play? Sure. Well, I've been thinking about consciousness for, for quite a while from this. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and on this episode of Skeptica, we welcome Dr. Bernardo Kastrup. Now, there's a name you haven't heard before. You know, when I started Skeptica, one of the goals that I had in mind was that there are a lot of really, really brilliant people out there that we don't really hear enough about. One of the goals of Skeptica was to bring those people forward, and I'm really happy to say that I think Bernardo Kastrup is just one such person. And I'd have to put his imaginative ideas and his creative way of describing them right up there among the very best guests we've had here on Skeptico. But what I'd really like to do is see what you think. So let's get on to my interview with Dr. Bernardo Kastrup. Today's guest is an author, blogger, an entrepreneur with a PhD in computer engineering, and an all-around fascinating guy, Bernardo Kastrup. Welcome to Skeptico. Thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Bernardo, a, a lot of folks might have come across you in the Skeptical Forum. I read a terrific blog post of yours in your blog, 